Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this Randox Molecular Diagnostics presentation. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the need for robust molecular quality assurance in the wake of the pandemic. I'm joined today by Ben Crawford, Molecular Team Leader here at Randox, and Rasham Hussain, Clinical Scientist of Microbiology at the Royal Bolton NHS Trust. Firstly, I will open by presenting an introduction to third party molecular QC, why it's important and where the demand and change has come from. Then Roshana, our guest speaker, um, will say a few words about her uh, personal experience with third party QC. And then Ben will follow uh, discussing a few of the uh, relevant products from our molecular QC range. So, uh, my discussion points. Um, so, um, change in trends over the last 20 years. So I want to basically talk about where this demand has come from in terms of molecular QC and, and why all of a sudden um, uh, organizations are being pressured to purchase and uh, to use uh, molecular QC. Um, and then why third party controls specifically? Why not, you know, why not first party or, or other alternatives? Uh, the regulations uh, involved in, in uh, molecular testing and any implications of alternative methods. So firstly, in recent years, there's been an increase in, molecular, in, in the use of molecular diagnostic techniques compared to more traditional methods of detecting infectious diseases, um, such as culture or, um, you know, um, and this has resulted in faster specimen turn turnaround times, accurate pathogen identification, greater assay sensitivity, syn syndromic multiplex testing from single patient samples, improved confidence in results, better patient outcomes and improved clinical decision making. So changing trends. The introduction of new molecular tests has brought with it the need to implement quality control measures to ensure the accuracy and precision of results. As with all diagnostic tests, the use of third party controls must be implemented with molecular assays as prescribed by international standards, such as ISO. And first party or assay manufacturer controls cannot be relied on to safeguard the accuracy and precision of patient results. So last year, early on last year, we had we had this massive influx of of demand by the industry, um, and suddenly all these all these manufacturers that hadn't really been on the scene before or hadn't hadn't really established before, all of a sudden started started targeting PCR, um, as it's like the, known as the gold standard for testing for COVID. And um, this resulted, I mean, that the whole uh, pandemic resulted in a shortage of supply from manufacturers. We had a, a massive injection of money from government sources towards COVID testing. Therefore, all these, all, these, um, all these manufacturers were pressured into making COVID solutions and trying to get solutions to market as soon as possible. Um, this resulted in, in the rationing of kits uh, and, the, and the high demand of, of testing nationwide and international. Um, many private labs were set up purely to provide testing services and improvisation was needed by all parties. For example, the CL3 step down to CL2 for COVID. All this led to a rush in new manufacturing uh, of COVID related products, which needed to be quality controlled. Use of independent third party control materials should be considered either instead of or in addition to any control materials supplied by the reagent or instrument manufacturer. Third party controls. Therefore, by definition, independent or third party quality controls um, have not been designed or optimized for use with any instrument kit or method. 
This independence enables the quality control material to closely mirror the performance of patient samples, and in doing so, provides an unbiased independent assessment of analytical performance across multiple platforms. So why use third party independent controls? So we can use them to monitor the precision of results from test kits and non-commercial assays. They are aimed at preventing errors by constant and consistent monitoring over time. We can therefore uh, assess a variation between lots of reagents like shifts and drifts. Um, we can provide an independent mechanism to assure that results are reliable and therefore apply just in time corrective action to eliminate errors occurred during the process in a timely manner. And these are whole process controls designed to monitor the entire testing process. Therefore, designed closely as possible to mimic the patient sample. Types of quality control. So first party controls and built-in cartridge controls. First party control is a material within the reagent supply or test kit cartridge supplied by the diagnostic manufacturer. Therefore, these built-in controls can often exhibit bias and therefore cannot fairly control a test. First party controls will struggle to measure accuracy and precision, determine that lots of lot variation between batches of reagents, assess genetic diversity, assess linearity, detect shifts or drifts in test results, ensure accuracy of the entire testing process as they're not whole pathogen and assess specificity. And built-in cartridge controls are often, often process only, uh, sorry, are often only process controls that tell the user that an extraction or amplification step has occurred. They don't, rep they don't um, uh, represent the whole of the testing uh, method. Types of quality control. So pooled patient controls. This is another type of first party control because it's an in-house um, manufactured control by the consumer. Instead of a commercial QC, some labs make their own and use their own QC material using patient samples. These pooled patient positives are not third party and then therefore suffer from quite a few issues. They are uncharacterized. It can take a lot of time and money and, and staff manpower to, um, to, to, to make these. So therefore, you, you've got to bear that in mind in terms of purchasing against third party control. This can often be difficult to maintain re reproducibility for the large batch sizes. And how can assay drifts be monitored if our controls are constantly drifting too? And we get this endless loop of QC. So we are QCing the system, which with the QC, which has been QC'd by the system. So we, we don't actually have, have a fixed point of reference. We are constantly chasing if we use pooled patient controls. Immutability. Laborat the laboratory shall use quality control materials that react to the examining system in a manner as close as possible to patient samples. So let's not compare apples and oranges. Types of quality controls. Um, recombinant controls. Um, these are controls manufactured to, to mimic a, a true patient sample. So in, in an effort to save costs and increase profits, um, some QC manufacturers provide recombinant, recombinant organisms. These are recombined partial components of pathogen cells that aim to trick or fool the test system. These controls are fully extractable and contain gene targets of interest. However, they are not whole pathogen controls. They may not work on all analyzers and they do not therefore truly represent a, a, a mimic, that they are a mimic of a positive control. Frequency. Quality control materials shall be periodically examined with a frequency that is based on the stability of the procedure and the risk of harm to the patient from an erroneous result. So this is a chart I've taken slightly out of context 
But I just wanted to use it to uh, to illustrate um, that if we, if we use third party QC on a regular basis, we can apply corrective action as soon as possible um, to to the procedure. And therefore, it also demonstrates that if, if we just use IQA, uh, sorry, EQA, external quality assurance schemes, um, uh, the, the, often the gap between EQA challenges is, is too is too large to just use an EQA. As you see here uh, with the example, um, there's a lot of variation between results in between our IQA challenges. And therefore, we only actually see this by constant monitoring with internal quality controls. So when should we use third party IQC? Third party control should be used in the following instances. As a qualitative external process control, so daily or weekly, dependent on lab requirements. After a reagent lot change, on receipt of a new shipment, even if the shipment is the same lot. After system maintenance and or software upgrades. When troubleshooting poor performance, as a training tool to ensure staff competency, and any other major change to the to the testing procedure or environment. So here's an example of batch acceptance testing for cartridge based methods. And now this goes for any cartridge based system. Uh, it just happens that the, the one here I, I have chosen is the Banox Vivality. But if, if we have a, a batch of say um, a box of 10, 10 cartridges, for example, Rather than test a QC on every single cartridge, because that's obviously not possible, what we would do is we would test one cartridge in that batch with a positive QC and one cartridge in that batch with a negative QC. And therefore accept the batch based on those two results. Here is an example for a medium and or large throughput QC system. So we would run the um, the IQC uh, daily or of a um, of a suitable frequency to the to the um, testing method. So if we say daily, for example, we can monitor that control daily and and immediately see on a daily basis whether any corrective action needs to be taken. So in summary. There is no right or wrong master answer that applies to every lab. So it should be up to each lab to develop their own QC schedule method that suits both the testing um, by the throughput and the budget of the testing. And labs definitely need to work with their accrediting body to establish an acceptable standard that works for both parties. So that's the end of my part of the presentation, and I will now go on to introduce Roshan Hussain. Um, it was the clinical scientist of microbiology at the Royal Bolton Hospital, and she's going to say a few words regarding her personal experience with uh, with third party IQC. Um, so my talk is really going to be more from a clinical point of view, and in, in as far as the QCs really matter. The the time that we spend implementing them, finding them, the cost associated with them, does it really matter to the patient? And I I I'll, I hope that you'll be able to kind of get an understanding of that. So when I started about twenty years back um, in microbiology, um, I was told about the good old good old days of quality control, which often meant that just before Christmas. Um, the special brew that was fermented in the lab um, had to be tested and made, made sure it was up to standard. Um, so that was tend to tend to be somebody in the lab came in and had a quick test and third party controls were often somebody in biochemistry that came over and gave it the um, the th thumbs up and the green light to say it was OK. Um, and those were, so, well, maybe not necessarily the good old days, but that's what it, that's what happened back then. And I'm talking about the 80s. And I imagine just looking at some of the the individuals that are on the um, attending at the moment, I imagine some of you still have memories of those good old days. 
um, or maybe perhaps not so good old days. And then things started to change as the NHS started to change um, and we started to kind of think about professionalising um, scientists and the NHS and, and kind of putting into putting our laboratories on the same standards uh, with lots of the European standards that were in place and standards across the world. Um, the clinical pathology accreditation came into place in the early 90s. Um, it was created in 1990 to 1992, which I imagine is probably not that long ago for many of us. I know I definitely remember it. Uh, I imagine some of you weren't even born back then, which is a bit scary. Um, but yeah, the, the CPA came about in 1992 and laboratories had to start to think about how standards were going to be raised in the laboratory um, and one of the ways that was was in, that was introduced to raise the standard was around quality assurance of investigations how were we going to be able to provide evidence to say that the standard of work that we were providing and i'm not referring to the beer or the alcohol that was fermented i'm talking about the actual tests how these were going to be standardized how they were going to how evidence was going to be provided about the quality of it um, and these are some of the standards that were, were kind of introduced around that time. Now, even at this time in the background, many scientists weren't necessarily aware, but there was um, work being done in the background about um, putting into place the ISO standards and, and creating a UCAS accreditation and UCAS uh, even back in the the, the early 1990s, because UCAS originally came was a, a European standard that was developed or being developed in the late 1990s. Uh, sorry, in the late 1980s. So in the background, all the UCAS and the CPA accreditation was happening um, whilst we weren't necessarily aware of it in the in the labs themselves. Yeah. And then just as we all started to get really familiar with the CPA standards and we knew what we had to do and what needed to be done, um, in the early 2000s, there was talk and discussion around the UCAS accreditation and what would need to be done. And the first pilot laboratories were started to be uh, testing out the standards and what would need to be done um, for the amalgamation of CPA into UCAS accreditation um, and there was a lot a lot of information that was perhaps not available at that time but there was still a lot of work that was going out on um, and then in the uh, I'd say about 10 years on from the first pilots we saw the UCAS um, guidelines be uh, presented um, across the UK and kind of be informed that we would now be moving over from CPA over to UCAS and and this image kind of represents some of the reactions I imagine that many of us kind of went across and I, I say that from my own point of view just as I felt that I'd got into onto grips with what UCAS were, uh, CPA were expecting of us with regards to standards in the laboratory especially around quality standards and quality controls and material UCAS came about and it was significantly more um, specific than um, CPA was um, and, the, and, the, and, and a lot of the wording in UCAS is kind of it feels like it gives you the option but we are we're all aware that there's there's not necessarily an option to kind of put these standards and controls in place and one of the key um, notes that we we kind of um, identified was around the contra quality control material that says laboratories should choose material that reflects uh, clinical values and clinical decisions and that they should um, it should in theory implement third party controls now when it says should it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it means that we where there's a control available it should be implemented and that was quite daunting at first 
not necessarily because of the costs and the various um in microbiology i know we we haven't necessarily focused on third party controls we've always assumed that first party controls were adequate because that's what cp had uh, had always said that was acceptable so when we had kind of got over our despair we kind of realized that we didn't that the we needed to think about some aspects of implementing some of the new standards and thinking about third party controls in microbiology first of all the practical application um, a lot of processes and procedures into in in microbiology needed to kind of be verified and validated again um, which was very time consuming um, looking and, and it, that note about clinical decision what that really refers to is the, the gray area uh, gray areas very close to the cutoffs and and if you look at in-house uh, first party controls very often the positive control is very very high um, that's always going to give you a positive and the negative is 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 very negative there's 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 nothing in that in between area so a lot of time was going to be needed a lot of training was needed um, around uh, revalidating re verifying um, a lot of process and analyzers that we already had in place so it was going to be very time consuming from those points of the from those points and then secondly in some instances acquiring control material isn't easily um, isn't very easy the, in many instances I know we experience where controls just third party controls in some of the particularly the molecular platforms just weren't available and when they were available where they were available the cost associated with the control material was just phenomenal for very large quantities where you where we would possibly think about um, using controls over a period of time it wasn't going to be easy when we were thinking about cost associated with new lot numbers um, lot number variation various aspects of it the cost was just going to be accumulating and then we when we actually really sat and thought about it and, and kind of when you considered it the question was is where were the benefits was it the benefits to the laboratory was it to the trust was it to the patient and and was all this work that was being required by UCAS um, really important and who was it important to so yeah just from my introduction I I completely accept and understand um, and have felt the exact same feelings about control material and controlling um, processes and procedures and, and tests in the laboratory and moving into a more clinical um, side of microbiology I often reflect about do we need controls in 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 the laboratory as many controls as we we have been asked to do I've spot made a mis probably mistake there um, do we actually need the the clinical do we need controls in a clinical team and actually we do um, from a microbiologist for microbiologists we need it for clinical teams and we actually need it for the patient the patients want to know that the tests that are being performed on their samples are of the highest quality and of the highest standard and give the right and accurate results and we all have had experiences of where um, when there is a, a query around a sample that's very close to the cutoff um, and once you get uh, an issue around a really good test once there's questioning whether it's the right test or the how sensitivity how sensitive it's sensitive and specific it is it's very difficult to get microbiologists and clinical teams to become confident in that in that test and that procedure again any any kind of issues around um, results if it doesn't match the clinical picture can can be very difficult to kind of come back from creates that kind of air of um, misunderstanding and mistrust and we need it from we need QCs um, from a legal point of view um, to be able to provide evidence around um, the tests that we're performing and more and more 
in the laboratory, um, it's not just a legal process um, in as far as when there's a um, when the organisation or department's being sued for a, for a, for an incorrect results. It's actually around the freedom of information. Um, and there's a there was an act put in place that means that when um, anybody, whether it be the media or whether it be patients or family, are able to write into the organisation and ask questions around information in the laboratory. So the sampling, the testing, the number of positives that we have, any of that information has to be legally um, available to these to anybody who's asking and it has to be completed within a specific time frame but it also has to be honest it has to be factual and it has to be understandable to the person that is requesting that information so for all of those reasons there is a clinical need for for quality control material so yeah um freedom freedom of information requests everybody is now um, has information available to them at the fingertips constantly via, via the internet and everybody has access to Dr Google and everybody has ha, has a basic understanding these days and it is because people have access to Dr Google but it's also because education standards are much higher. Children are taught about science and um, basic testing and have a really good grasp of, of science these days. So and it, as education standards in, in science increase, patient knowledge will also increase. Freedom of choice, there's been a big push by the NHS for patients to have freedom of choice, to pick and choose what happens with um, where they want to be treated. Um, they have the option to have where they want their samples possibly to be tested or sent and, and be more involved with their patient care. And I think we've seen a lot of that in the in the last 12 months around the COVID pandemic. It's actually really heightened patients' knowledge and thirst for knowledge and understanding of knowledge. Um, the media interest has kind of pushed that and, and, and they've kind of kind of promoted um, understanding of what tests there are now. Everybody's aware of what an LFD is or a LFT and PCR tests and, and what they're looking for and antigens and antibodies. So, and I think that's just going to increase as we go forward and move forward. Um, and the pandemic has also, from one aspect, created a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there, misinformation. It's been limited access to hospitals so patients are more and more afraid of what's going on and so we are getting on a daily basis getting more of these freedom of information as, um, at, um, requests and I think one really important thing to say about uh, freedom of information requests is that it's a really really important and vital for the healing process of anybody who's lost a loved one especially in the pandemic where perhaps they've not been able to see them in the last moments or hours to know what happened to know that did they die of this condition did they die of covid what was the process it's really important for us to be able to provide evidence that says there was a really high standard of investigations in the hospital in the department not just around the covid test but around all the other samples that we receive as well um, and that's that really helps with a lot of individuals healing and acceptance of loss and death. So I'm going to kind of go through a case of one, one of the cases, one of the freedom of information cases that we've, we have had and, and a lot of the ones that we've had have been on a very similar kind of, um, kind of very similar kind of line in as far as someone's passed away. So this one was one where somebody had lost a father um, they tested negative when they were first tested, but two late, days later positive for, for COVID. And we're wanting to know why this could have been um, and how do they know which test was positive? Because it's 
it happens more often than not and we know for it's for a variety of reasons but patients don't necessarily always understand that and so being able to provide the evidence is really useful so first question is how how do they know that the, the sample that they, was taken at a and e was um right or wrong and and, and really that the, we we don't know what's going on with a lot of the point of care tests, whether it'll be LFDs or whether it be molecular platforms, unless there's um, quality control material put in place, first party and third party and all the EQA material that we receive as well. But what we do know is that it's for a, ver for a, a variety of numbers, uh, what the disease phase that they're at, what was sampling like, what was a platform like. And, and it's kind of difficult for people to understand this, but these are a lot of the things that we need to be thinking about when we are looking for control material, especially third party control material. Are we able to mimic um, issues, real life issues that are going to occur, poor sampling? So that's low uh, antigen um, presence in the sample, uh, a control material, third party control that's going to um, test the limits of sensitivity and specificity of, of the um, test um, and so it's really important that first party controls like I said are either really high positives or really no low negatives and trying to find control material that's able to cover a wide aspect of, of testing is really important so it should mimic these this is what UCAS are kind of saying that you should be acquiring or implementing control material that are able to mimic situations, real life situations. And then how do we give them evidence? How when we're responding to the freedom of information, do we do we know that the correct test is correct? So the first thing that we would always do is staff training. Who's done the, 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 the training of, of the test? that's in place, look at the verification, validation, we provide that evidence and we say and include the control material that we have used in those processes. Um, and we provide them with evidence of the daily tests that we perform. So the con manufacturer's control, we discuss whether these are adequate and, and we kind of state to the patient, well, your test or your sample fell in, in line with this or didn't quite do so in, in the way that we expected. Um, and then in, we, we would discuss the third party controls as well while we do those, looking at values, the specific values around clinical decisions in the grey areas, um, just below and above the, the cutoff and, and, and explain that there hasn't been every, any drift or shifts in the testing um, over a period of time. So we gives that individual and gives us the confidence as well to know how a test and a platform is performing over a period of time, not just on that particular day. So all of these kind of all of this evidence gives not just us the reassurance that we are performing correct tests, but it also gives the patient um, really valid information as to and confidence as to the tests that are being performed on their samples. And more importantly, the samples of their loved ones are being performed correctly, accurately, and of a high standard. Um, and one of the important things it is important thing to say is that third party controls are designed to deliver an independent, unbiased assessment of performance. So we can say, yes, we know that the, the, the controls that we have in place are not controls that we have made or that we have 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 decided upon well have decided upon but have made to kind of validate the work that we are doing in the lab and it is important import evidence of the tests and the standards of tests that we do and for and the control material that we use is really important for a, a number of key reasons and, and I think the most important has to be for, for the trust of the patient. We've seen over the last 12 months what happens when there's mistrust around testing um, and the different tests that are available and misinformation about the different tests that are, in, that are around about the, the COVID test. And I think that will seep into all parts of 
diagnostic testing in hospitals or in laboratories, patients now are much more aware of what is going on, what tests that they need to have, why they need to have them, how they work, what they're looking for. So we need to kind of rebuild that, that trust in patients. And, and mistrust can have a huge impact um, on patients long term. Um, we all know, we're all aware of, of and, and I, I've got to say, I'm, I can be to blame as well in some aspects. I'll go to a GP and I'll say, these are the tests that I want to have. And I, I, I know the reasons X, Y and Z. But very often, the average person who isn't from a medical background may not fully appreciate the test that they need at that moment of time. It might be detrimental for the outcome of their disease state, for the diagnosis of new um, illnesses. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's also important to have that evidence for legal action because you never you're never aware when there's going to be legal action against the organisation with regards to problems or issues. And one of my fears more than anything else is <coughs> not necessarily legal action, but it's having to answer for the things that we've done or are doing in the laboratory and the standards of our tests in a coroner's court. And, that, and, and QC material, first party, third party in particular, is a huge piece of evidence and strong evidence that you would want to have in your hand if you were ever ca called up to coroner's court and, and to justify the decisions that had been made around a test that from a clinical point of view. Those are the things that I would be taking and saying, this is the evidence that we have. I made those decisions based on, on, on the information that I had and the information I had was very strong or perhaps very weak. So I think, does it matter? I think that's a question that you can ask, answer. Um, does it really matter? Does it matter from a laboratory point of view? Does it matter from a trust point of view? Does it matter from a patient point of view? And I think as we're, where there's a potential, we're all patients, we're all concerned at the moment of our loved ones and ourselves. Um, it does matter. You want to know that the, the test that has, that's been performed on your sample is the best test ever um, and that it's being challenged because there's more grey areas than people realise so and that's where I'll leave my talk thank you very much perfect okay so um Randox um basically we, we are one of the world's um, biggest providers for independent third-party control standards and um, it's it's one of the biggest parts of our business. Traditionally, we have always been focused within the realms of, of biochemistry, um, but in recent years that has changed. Um, we do now have a strategic partnership with a, a group from Glasgow um, called Qnostics. So hopefully you all know where Glasgow is, but I put a map up there just in case you don't. Um, Qnostics is based in, in Glasgow. It's where all of the research and development is done, where all of the manufacturing is done, where our products ship from. Um, we are a UK company and our sole aim at the moment or our main aim is, is the supply um, of quality control to assist with UK and Irish labs. Um, it's, it's something that we hold very dear. Um, so in the UK and, and Ireland, um, we, we have a very extensive um, support network for our customers at the moment. There are about 11 different sales executives across the United Kingdom and, and Republic of Ireland. Um, Within this, there are then four uh, molecular product specialists, of which myself and Bradley are part of that team. And the whole idea of this is that we provide round the clock service for our portfolios of, of molecular product lines, including QC application support, troubleshooting anything that any issues people are experiencing with, with QCMD items, QCMD EQA report interpretation, um, educational lunch and learns, similar to what we're doing now, but hopefully in the future in, in your labs, and then on-site technical support for some of our diagnostic analyzers as well. So what does Qnostics offer? Basically, Qnostics offers a range of third-party internal quality control solutions, and we provide controls for all sorts of infections, so respiratory infections, transplant-related viruses, um, gastrointestinal infections, sexually transmitted infections, central nervous system infections, and, and also blood-borne viruses. 
Um, as you can imagine, a lot of our focus in the last uh, 12 months has been with uh, COVID, um, but uh, we do have a, a very large repertoire of, of other controls and standards to assist labs. So overall, the features of, of what we offer, all of our controls, all of our materials are what we describe as whole pathogen. This means that the, the organisms that we contain within our, our, our samples are exactly the same as what you get in a patient sample. The only difference is that they are inactivated. Um, the advantage for the user is that they can be used in the exact same way as a patient sample. So similar to what Roshana was saying, your controls should be you know, representative of what you're doing with your patient samples. So the controls can run from start to finish, extraction to result without issue. They're flexible because they're whole pathogen. It means the full genome is there, full complement of genetic information um, that you would get in, in the, the real patient sample is also inside our controls. And this has the advantage of meaning that our controls are, are compatible with, with all assays on the market. It doesn't matter what you use our control on, it will recover provided it's above LOD for that assay. The controls themselves are inactivated. And um, so we blast them with uh, a radiation and we also cook them for a little while. And this means that they're, they're safe for handling. And this is obviously very important with samples such as SARS-CoV-2, but also with some new controls that we have out or are coming out um, for, for the likes of tuberculosis, um, which you wouldn't want to be handling if it was not inactivated in, in a, a CAT2 area. The controls themselves are, are also liquid frozen. This means they're very convenient and easy to use. All you need to do is take them out of the freezer let them turn into liquid and then run them straight on the analyzer um, as you see fit, exactly the same way as you would with a patient sample. Uh, they're also very stable. Um, so when frozen, our controls have a, a frozen stability of two years from the date we manufacture them. Um, with some of our controls, we do also provide a liquid um, thawed stability. So for instance, with our COVID controls, they have a stability of five days at two to eight. So once they're frozen, they can be put in the fridge for five days and, and brought out of the fridge and used as required. We like to think that we provide a very good level of consolidation. So Qnostics and Randox, ultimately our, our aim is to basically ensure that you have a one-stop shop in a way for your molecular um, IQC needs. We have a full range of molecular controls, and I'll go into them in overview in a moment. Um, and basically, this means that you can use Randox as, as sort of your, your go-to if, if you need for, for any molecular application. We provide multi-analyte materials, so where appropriate, we will provide uh, multi-analyte controls designed for use with multiplex assays. So as we know, there's, there's lots of different respiratory assays coming onto the market at the moment. We've got controls to fit those, those assays. Well, our organisms are traceable and uh, where possible to WHO standards, which we'll talk a little about in a moment with COVID. And all of our controls are, are true third party. So we are not affiliated with, we are not part of any diagnostic or, or analyzer manufacturer. Um, we, we basically make our controls independently of, of those instruments and those assays. We do sometimes run our controls on those instruments, but we're not working in tandem with those manufacturers to, to assist them in any way. So the full range, a one-stop shop. So we, we provide respiratory controls, things like flu, RSV, COVID, um, transplant-related infections, things like CMV, EBV, BK, blood-borne viruses, Hep B, Hep C, HIV, gastrointestinal diseases. We cover things like norovirus, astrovirus, sapovirus, a lot of different bacterial targets, some E. coli targets as well. We have some drug-resistant organisms, including TB, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, we have some CNS infection analytes. Um, we provide multiple pathogen or syndromic panels, um, so kits that have multiple analytes combined into single um, samples. We cover sexually transmitted infections, things like CTNG, Mycoplasma genitalium, Trichomonas vaginalis. And then, excitingly this year, we have some new exotic and emerging diseases, maybe not too applicable for the United Kingdom or this part of the world, but we do have the, the availability of things like Zika and Dengue, should it be required. I know some blood banks do run those um, at some reference sites anyway. So our controls are mainly, not always, but mainly broken down into three different types. We have Q controls, and these are basically kits that always have five vials of a certain volume. They could be 0.5 mil or 1 mil, 1.2 mil, depending on the analyte. And basically, they're designed to be used as run controls, so sequentially, once after the other, um, and trended over time to ensure that you can monitor any shifts or drifts in your assays. 
Obviously, some tests are quantitative, and, and for those assays, we offer molecular Q panels. Molecular Q panels have a low level, a medium level, and a high level. And the design of these panels is basically to ensure that on a quantitative assay, you can ensure that the, there's consistency over time at across the measuring range at the low level, at the medium level, and at the high level. We do also have serial dilution kits, analytical Q panels, and these have been very important during COVID. Um, obviously, there's been lots of new assays, lots of new tests, and lots of new machines being being implemented. And we have serial dilution kits for, for most analytes, but including COVID, and they've been vi vital for, for validation and verification as new instruments and assays have come online in sites. To give you an example of, of how the Q controls look, these are our transplant um, related infection um, controls, adenovirus, BK, CMV, EBV. And you can see that basically each kit is five vials, one mil, and each of those uh, kits basically has a different concentration. Um, all of the vials within those kits would be the same concentration. Molecular Q panels, again, um, each of these kits for the transplant related infections, four vials, um, each of one mil, um, each MQP or molecular Q panel contains three vials, positive and one negative, a low level, a medium level and a high level. And then our analytical Q panels, again, I've used the transplant related infections to sort of display them, but we cover a range of different concentrations to provide um, labs with the ability to do validation and verification across the measuring range, which is particularly important within quantitative assays. So today's theme was beyond COVID, but we do have some new things to talk about with our COVID controls, so it's worth mentioning them to you very quickly at the start here. So this is our range of, of SARS-CoV-2 controls. Basically, all of our controls, as I've mentioned, are whole pathogen. They contain whole inactivated SARS-CoV-2 virus in transport medium. Um, all of our controls do contain human background cells, which means that internal gene targets or control targets will flag as positive. Um, these QCs have been characterized extensively on a, on, a, on a wide range of different molecular workflows and assays. We know very, very well what is inside our, our controls. Um, we have an analytical Q panel, um, again, very good for validation and verification, very popular um, throughout the United Kingdom and Ireland for validation and verification as COVID came online. And obviously, as there's been issues with, with different stock levels for different assay manufacturers, lots of different assays have been implemented um, across the pandemic and throughout the pandemic. It's been very important for that too. Molecular Q panel, again, a low level, a medium level, a high level and a negative. The run control, the Q control, um, five positives, 0.5 mil, um, each at a, a 10,000 copies per mil concentration, and then a negative should it be required by your lab. What we've done recently is that we've calibrated our SARS-CoV-2 range against the, the first international WHO standard for SARS-CoV-2, the 20 slash 146 um, international standard. This has been characterized using digital droplet real-time PCR, um, and as you can see from the, the graph here or the table here, I'll just bring up my pointer so I can show you. Um, the, the values here on the left hand side, these are these are digital droplet copies per mil uh, values for our using our in-house um, digital droplet PCR method. And these are the different levels within our analytical Q panel, each of the concentrations. And if we go to the far right hand side here, we can see where the molecular Q panel and where the Q control sit within these concentrations. So about 10,000 copies per mil for the Q control and then three levels below that and a negative uh, for, for the molecular Q panel. Importantly, in the middle here, we can see how we have basically standardized these against the international standards. So this is in the international units per mil, as it's now going to be known. And, and you can see basically how our, our controls will relate to this international standard, which is important. I think as time goes on, we'll see assays hopefully becoming calibrated together so we can sort of draw proper comparisons between them. So today, our SARS-CoV-2 controls are used by much of the NHS, Public Health England, the Lighthouse Laboratories, um, academic institutions, pharma, and, and other laboratories all over the world. Um, they've been vital as, as process controls um, for batch acceptance tests with, with cartridge-based instruments for system maintenance as a training tool. 
um, in verifying claims made by diagnostic manufacturers, which was obviously very important at the start when a lot of these assays were getting out on the market without the usual or normal rigorous tests. Um, and then in, in drawing comparisons between different instrument and assay manufacturers. So beyond COVID, um, obviously we're moving into the summer period now and we'll see a general dip within COVID and, and obviously within other respiratory viruses, even though they haven't been very prevalent in the last year. Um, as everyone will know, over, over time, you know, that the most popular winter assay has been the influenza A, B and RSV A test. This has now been superseded, replaced by influenza A, B, RSV and SARS-CoV-2 fourplex assays. Um, and everyone is bringing out a test like this at the moment. We know that Gene Expert are bringing out tests, um, um, Roche, um, Abbott, they're all moving towards this sort of fourplex um, sort of format in a way. Um, the types of analyzers are all the ones that you'll have in your labs, cartridge-based machines, high throughput, automatic analyzers and step-by-step real-time PCR kits as well. Um, obviously then there's the syndromic panels, um, assays such as our own, um, the respiratory tract infection array that Randox provides, which covers different viral and bacterial targets. Usually the syndromic panels cover 10 or more analytes and they're aimed at reducing the number of individual tests required to correctly identify what the cause of infection is. And often uh, they're a com combination of viral and bacterial targets, such as with our assay. It also enables labs and, and, and doctors, clinical scientists to detect and, and sort of effectively treat co-infections with multiple respiratory organisms. So these types of assays obviously pose a problem for QC. You've got a lot of analytes here and they all need to be quality controlled, ideally. And um, there's different regimens that you can implement to ensure that you're doing this. Um, but one of the biggest problems we see is that it's very difficult to actually combine all of the analytes into a single vial. If you're to do this with whole pathogens, you'll find that there's competition, there's dilution effects, and, and ultimately not all the analytes will recover on all the machines that are on the market. It's just not possible. We do find that some uh, providers will, will use plasmids uh, and vectors. Um, they'll basically insert gen genetic material into the controls, spike it in there to ensure that it's at high levels. That's not something at, at Randox and Cunostics we're keen on doing. We want to basically have all of our controls as close as possible to the patient. Um, so we always basically go for whole pathogen controls. We don't compromise um, on whole pathogen. This is our respiratory multiplex or our RTX QC range. And basically what we have done is that we have created five separate kits. At the moment, this is mainly viral, um, but we are bringing out an RTX 6 um, near winter, which will include more of the bacterial targets. And within RTX 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we have basically combined different combinations of common uh, viral respiratory targets into basically little fourplex um, kits. Each box contains five vials. Each vial is 0.7 mil, allowing for maximum compatibility with input volumes on most of the analyzers. These controls have been used on, on different common analyzers. So a common instrument here, the Gene Expert, and they have a SARS-CoV-2 flu RSV, the, the Expert Express assay. And these are the general sort of ranges of CT values that you'd expect with each of the uh, the, the targets with our RTX1 QC. Um, you can see sort of a target value or a target range and then sort of where a typical average will be within that. Same is true for the BioFire. Biomera used BioFire or their respiratory panel 2.1 plus. We have again put our controls through that and, and obviously we, we've We've got it to a point now where basically the, the controls are all coming back positive with this instrument. Obviously, Legionella isn't included on the assay and it's not not it's not something that it will detect. So it's not detected there, but everything else is coming back nice and positive. And then we have the, the Chiastat DX from Chiagen. Um, again, we can see that all of the, the analytes are returning a positive and we've also got CT sort of values that you would expect to get on that instrument that we can now provide as well. In addition to the multiplex kits, it's obviously a case that, you know, as we go into winter, as we move out of summer, um, we're going to have more and more multiplex tests coming online. And it's important that we understand fully how those assays are working, um, particularly for the important seasonal um, respiratory targets. So we've already talked about our uh, SARS-CoV-2 
um, analytical Q panel, but we do also now have quantified by digital droplet real time PCR um, analytical Q panels for influenza A, influenza B, RSV A, RSV B, and then para influenza type one and rhinovirus as well. Should they be needed? Should they be needed? We do also have uh, three new whole pathogen and inactivated tuberculosis controls. Um, at the top of the screen here, we can see our evaluation panel. This is basically a kit with seven vials of which six are positive um, and one negative, and they contain all of the, the TB strains that you would possibly be looking for. So we have straight up TB along with TB with RIF resistance and TB with IZ resistance as well as a negative uh, uh, sputum neg negative within that. As well as that, we do also have a, a run control straight up TB with no resistance and then a TB control with resistance to RIF. Um, and these two controls have been built in mind with the, the Cephi gene expert assay um, for, for MTB RIF Ultra, I believe it's called. And we have verified the use of these controls on that analyzer. It does recover well and it does stress the assay and ensures that it's doing what it's meant to be doing. Obviously, we're always working to improve and in 2021, we do hope to bring out a range of other controls as well. Um, so we have sort of a, a new take on, on chlamydia gonorrhea controls. Traditionally, um, controls tend to be delivered in a, in a type of transport medium matrix, uh, as far as we're aware, um, but we're branching out of that, on that now. We are going to provide a, a transport medium control um, representative of, a, of what you might get from a typical swab sample and then also a urine sample as well, a urine CTNG. So you can now stress your CTNG assays or control them um, using appropriate sample types with whole pathogen organisms. We have an enterovirus evaluation panel, an enterovirus Q control, a combined norovirus G1 and G2 Q control, which will be verified on the Gene Expert platform. Um, we have a plasma negative QC, um, a synthetic fecal matrix negative control, a urine negative control, which fits in nicely with our chlamydia gonorrhea, and then a vancomycin resistant um, enterococci control as well. Um, so that that's the end of that. Um, basically, if you have any questions about any of the products, or if you have any more questions for Roshanna or Bradley, um, you you can you can sort of message it into the chat right now if you want, and we we can try and answer them here on the fly. Or if, if needs be, you can you can send through questions to either myself um, or Bradley. Um, these can either be for for me or Bradley, or they they can be for Roshanna, and we'll make sure that they get through to Roshanna and that she can reply to you. Um, of course.